Although the one minute chart seems a little overkill to me, it might be your best bet. You're talking about being in a strangle that you have on the last day of expiration and you're trying to close it. You're probably battling between 10 or 15 cents and 10 or 15 cents, depending on what your original cost was on this strangle, might change a loss to a profit. Okay, so the one minute chart might be your best bet. Now, I'll be honest with you, in general, if I have a position, even a strangle that I've held to the final day, or if I just have sold a call on a stock that's fluctuating right around the strike price, and I don't want to be assigned, but I don't want to pay the money yet to buy it back, in general, I will look at the five minute chart during the trading day personally. But if I have not closed the position by the last two hours, by let's say 2 p.m. Eastern time, I may switch over to the one minute. Now, I don't have all of the information for Paul's approach and what he's doing. But let's say I did a weekly strangle on GOOS. And for Goose on Monday, July 2nd, the stock was trading around 58.88. Now, I might have entered a strangle for today's expiration, a weekly strangle, no earnings event here. I usually only do strangles around an earnings event in this type of fashion. Um, but in any case, let's say on Monday, what I would have done is bought to open the 6th of July, 58 put just out of the money for 68 cents. And I would have bought kind of at the money in this case. Uh, I wouldn't have messed around with the 59.50s, but probably would have bought the 6th of July, 59 call at 95 cents. So my total debit for these two options would be $1.63 per contract on the position. And let me just scroll down here. There we go. Now, this was not a good trade. Goose at about 3.15 p.m. Eastern time today was at 59.79. Um, so the call was at about 79 cents. The put's essentially at zero. 79 cents, 80 cents back on a 163 debit. It's a 50.5% loss. But during this week, GOOS went as high as 61.45 and as low as 56.75. So I could have gotten at least maybe $1.25, $1.50 for the 58 put at the low and about $2, or if I really caught it, $2.45 for the call. So it would have been really profitable. However, I'm sorry, this is the weekly chart. There's Monday open and you see that was the gap down. And we're saying at some time during Monday, with the stock right around, let me get a good pen color here, the stock right around 58.88 is when we might have gotten into this strangle position on Monday. Okay, so that was the Monday open and it did go as low as 56.50 that day. Might have closed the put on the first day if we got in early enough, caught the low and then it came back up. Hard to tell, but in any case, as we go through, we see the high was hit today, 61.48, the high was hit this morning in the first couple of hours. Okay, this is just an hourly chart, but I'm just using this as an example. But let's go back. We opened this position on Monday. Didn't close the call here. We didn't close the call here. We didn't close the put here. We didn't close the put here. We're still in the position as of 9.30 when the bell rings this morning. All right, so on the one minute chart, we open here, of course, at 9.30. This would be, you know, 10 a.m., Here's 11 and so forth throughout the day. Using what I use for RSI and MACD, I look at them for confirming signals, meaning if I see the RSI weekend, I wait to see the confirming crossover on MACD. So MACD crossed over negative at around 1050. The RSI was probably at around 945 when that started to weaken off its peak. So right about here, I would have likely sold the call seeing the MACD crossover to the negative in this case, and the RSI already weakened, bounced off the top of the bull and ran. I missed the high, okay, you know, it was still here to peak, but it didn't really have a good crossover. So I'd have closed here maybe at 61.15, and I would have gotten 2.15 back for the call. Now at the same time going forward, we follow it down. The MACD is still declining, RSI is still weakening, but then it shifts here right before 11 a.m., and we get a positive MACD crossover, maybe at 10.45 or so. And of course, the stock here, the put bounced off the low. Not, not the full low, but it bounced off this low here and came back. So we might have closed it when the stock was at 59.65, and the put would have been for 20 or 30 cents. Let's call it 25. So we get out at 2.15, and that's just intrinsic. 
25 bid ask spread after it came down off that low, maybe. Get out at 240, debit of 163, so we have a profit of 77 cents or 47.2%. That's on the one minute chart. Now, we did miss the low of the day. That's down here, okay? We didn't get to that low of the day. We would have exited the position earlier. Now, Sam uh, joins us on these webinars from time to time. What he might have done here is when he saw the crossover, sold the put and bought a call. Sees the next crossover, sold the call, and then maybe bought a put. Sees the next crossover and so forth. Now, I'm not going to try to trade in and out of it like that. If I had a strangle that I had all the way to expiration, this is what I would have seen on this particular example. I would have gotten out with a profit of 47.2%, but I would have missed the low of the day, and it didn't quite catch the high but it still got a profitable on that part of the spread, the strangle. All right, five minute chart. And what happens when you extend time? You smooth out the indicators. Uh, Paul says, my voice has dropped out. Um, my audio is still showing that I'm perfectly fine, Paul. So um, if you're, oh, there you go, Paul, okay. I'm sure it recorded okay. It would have give, it usually gives me a signal saying that the audio is low. I didn't see anything pop up. But in any case, with these kind of indicators, sure, we saw the RSI weakening almost at about the same time, 9.45 a.m. But we didn't get the confirming signal of the MACD or stock dropping below that 20-day moving average or even if the five-day moving average, I believe. We didn't see that until 11.20 or so. Well, now the stock's at 60.25 to 60.50, roughly. So let's say it's about 60.25. I sell to close here when I get the confirming signal of the negative MACD cross. The RSI has been weakening, and it gets to this level here. I didn't catch it here. Definitely didn't catch it here. I caught it here. Now it's 125 for the call. That's about a 30 cent profit from where I purchased it. And then as we go further down along the time, we see the positive MACD crossover on the five minute chart with the RSI change, and that did catch the low, didn't it? But we have a 58 put. The low for the day was 58.75, so we might have gotten 35, 40 cents for it at that time. It still didn't drop below our put strike price for any intrinsic value. So we get $1.25 for the call, lower than we would have with the one minute. 40 cents for the put, maybe, but close to that. You still had a few hours to go. So we get a dollar sixty-five back, legging out. Profit of two cents or one point two percent. Now it's interesting, of course, isn't it? The smoothing effect going with the longer time frame. We missed the high, and we missed the other high we would have seen on the one minute chart. But we did get the low of the day on the five minute, which we would have been out earlier with the one minute, but 1.2% versus 47%. Finally, you know, you asked about 15 minutes uh, or half an hour. Oh, sorry, folks. Okay, so 15 minute chart. Here again, we see the RSI weakening, but we don't see it cross below the line or that MACD crossover again. Now we're at about 1050, 1045. The stock's a little bit lower. It's about at 59.80. We might only get 90 cents for the call, which is still a profit. But then we don't see the positive MACD crossover until later, almost at the same price, 59.75. Not at the low of the day, not at the previous low we got out of. So sell the put at seven, get 97 back, but we're a loss of 66 cents or 40.5% negative on the position. Okay, might have gotten 10 cents, might have gotten 5 cents, I don't know. Okay, now, recap. The one minute chart, we would have closed right around 10 a.m. for 2.15. Didn't catch the high of the day, but got it close when we saw the confirming signal of the RSI weakening, MACD negative crossover. Um, that was close to the high of the day. It would have closed the put about 50 minutes later for about, you know, 25 cents or so. Oh, I'm sorry, I read, the, I read the times wrong. We were looking at closing the put. I was, I was way off there on closing the put. Uh, but anyway, it was about 10.50 a.m., 50 minutes later. Maybe we've gotten 25 cents, maybe 30 cents, but 2.40 back, 77 cent profit of 
with the five minute, we didn't see the crossover until about 20 minutes later when the stock was at 60.25. Intrinsic value for our 59 call, we get 125 back. Two hours later is when we would have closed the put at 12.20, and that would have been about 40 cents. 58.75, we did catch the low, but we've only got three hours to go, and the stock's not trading at or below our put strike price. So we're just playing around with market maker bid ask spread at that time. Get a gain of two cents or 1.2%. And the 15 minutes, again, more smoothed. We don't get out of the call until 10.50 when we would have gotten out of the put here using the one minute. That's when we get out of the call, but only for about 90 cents. We don't close the put until an hour left in the trading day. It's at 59.75. We're holding a 58 put. Five cents, 10 cents, we'll call it seven to be nice. We get 97 back, we take a loss of 40.5%. So, although I think the one minute is overkill, this clearly shows that in this example, the one minute was the better one, even though we missed the low of the day. And if you're actively trading, remember, you can always buy another put if you see a uh, negative MACD crossover, you already closed out, but then you see another one and it looks like it's gonna go down further. You might just buy another put, cheap put, and if it keeps going down, you get some more stuff. <laughs> you get some more premium. Hard to say. I don't day trade like that. But if you do end up finding yourself holding a position to the end of the day and you're worried, it's, this is the same thing I would look at for a, a covered call. It's right at your strike price. You don't want to be assigned. It's 10 cents above than 20 cents below. I'd look for a negative crossover. And if I see a positive crossover and it looks like the stock's going to move up, I'm going to buy back the call. Even if it settles three hours later and would have expired worthless, I don't have to watch it for the rest of the day. I'm out of it. And I might not have even closed that covered call. As I mentioned, I might have just rolled it further out. But if you're going to try to time the strangles on the last day to maximize profit, from what I'm seeing with this example here and another one I looked at at IBKR today, although we would have caught the low again, with the five minute chart, it looks like this was the best performance to use. One minute chart in this case. And Paul, what I'm gonna to recommend to you is you go back and you look at some of your positions, your strangles that you were closing today or playing around with today, and do the same thing I just did. Go into your chart, look at the one minute chart, pick where you would have gotten out at A and B or C or D based on your technical crossovers and confirming signals. Calculate what the profit would have been as you gotten out at those times. Then look at the 5, the 15, and the 30. Do the same thing we just did here and sort of calculate for yourself which one gave you the best return. Now, it might not be the same for, let's say you had five positions today. It might not be the same one for all five, but try to get an average, an eyeball average of which chart works best when you're tracking it at the end of the day to try to get out of these positions. All right, very quickly now, we're going to go to the Power Options tools. I've got six questions, it looks like, uh, behind these two. I've got David, going to get to you next after this. Jonathan, Alex, and Rajiv, we've got a few comments as well. And uh, Alessandra, you said great job on that one. Thank you, I do appreciate that. Okay, so the other question that came in was from Brian earlier today. Uh, Brian likes the stock ADP. And what he wants to know is, can he do a search on Power Options in any strategy? that shows me similar stocks uh, with the same uh, long, long, long-term upward trend, but at $50 or less? And the answer is yes, of course. The first thing you've got to do is check out the stock detail page for what are the technicals you're looking for. Okay, what are the technicals that match ADP? Then simply put those into the search and put in your stock price range, okay? And we'll just go ahead and do that right now. We're going to navigate over to the Power Options suite of tools very quickly. There you go. Let's pause the screen there. And I'm going to remember this time, ladies and gentlemen, I promise to unpause the screen. All right, let's switch it up here. I want to go to screen one. Okay. And what we're looking at here is the power. It's coming up. There we go. Aha, perfect. Okay, so this is just the 14-day free trial of Power Options. Those of you that are just getting started, I encourage you to follow step one, step two, step three, and step four with the 
webinars and education to get more familiar with the tools in the site. Now, ADP. What I will do first, I have a stock or I'm looking at a stock and I want to find others like it. So what I'm going to do is go to the quotes page. This gives us a breakdown of everything that we might want to see. All of the data we have here at Power Options for the stock. Average volume, 2.3 million shares. I'm just going to write that down. Okay, Average volume is 2.3 million. And other things I want to see here is that this stock is, that long trend he was talking about is 61 days above the SMA 50. It's not above the SMA 20 anymore, which is a little concerning, but it is above the 50 day. And at the 20, SMA 20 has been above the 50 for 51 days. So that's SMA 20, 51 above the SMA 50. Other things I might want to look for, okay, good positive earnings, double digits, so I want some good earnings on that one. Uh, see here, it's not, it's a negative MACD actually, but the MACD is at 0.77, but it's in 11 days under. So the MACD is not positive, which is also a little bit concerning on this one. Um, but as far as just the standard uptrend, the long-term uptrend, been down recently, a little correction as of late, then we're going to go ahead and use those. Volatility, am I worried about that? No, nah, it's so low. It's in the 0.19s. We're going to go volatility of less than 0.3. And this stock's at 134.22. All right, now I'm just going to use a long call search. I'm going to simulate a long call search for a stock search without putting in on any options criteria except for two things, okay? So let's go to long call. And I'm going to go into the search tool. And the first thing I'm going to do is clear out all of the settings. Now, what I'm going to do first might be a little bit confusing, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the expiration time frame to July 20th, a standard expiration, because every optionable stock has options that are expiring on July 20th. Okay? So let me just go to July 20th, 15 days away. And what I'm also going to do is just quickly limit the strikes out of the money to be one-to-one. -one. Because I only want to see one option for each stock that matches. And I know I'm not, this is just to find, to help find stocks. I'm using this as a synthetic stock search, if you will. Now, what were our requirements? Well, the fundamentals, I want stocks under $50. I mean, we'll put, say maybe greater than two, but we want stocks under $50. We saw that positive maybe 10 to 15% earnings per share growth. I'm going to plug that in as well. Now let's go to technicals. The stock was not trading above the 20-day moving average, but we did see a stock that is currently above its 50-day moving average by 61 days. So I'm going to put over by at least 60 days. Days stock crossed the SMA 50. And then days the SMA 20 has been above the SMA 50 was 50 days, 51. All right, so I'm just going to put 50. Those are the two technicals we'll look at. Now, I could have looked at the Bollinger Bands. I didn't see a positive MACD. It came up negative. So I'm not even going to use the MACD in this case because I don't want to plug in a negative number for it. But we did have average stock volume, didn't we? It was 2.3 million shares. Now, this actually in Power Options is measured in thousands. Oops, sorry, folks. So if I want to see something above 2 point, let's just call it 2 million. So I'm going to look for something greater than 2,000 for the average stock volume. Okay? And that's all I'm going to do. Let's go ahead and submit the search. How many optionable stocks are out there? Oh, another one did come up here. That is strange. It's listed twice. That should never happen. Two July 44 calls, 14 days remaining to expiration. Oh, I, it put me in bull puts. I'm sorry, I wanted long call. That's okay, we'll, we'll just use this. But I have 16 results, all that match that exact criteria. I got what I wanted on the quotes page. I plugged it in, we've got tenant. Okay, so it's less, I'm sorry, they did double up because I'm in the bull put spread search. Let me just show one result per security. That's another way to do it, but it's good to narrow it down further. Okay, so there's six. So, Brian, there are six stocks that have that same uptrend, average stock volume, and positive double-digit earnings per shares. You've got California Resources, Intelsat, National Oil Well Varco, Carrizo Oil, Tenet Healthcare, and Oasis Petroleum.
$44 to $13 per share. That's how you would do it. Get on that quotes page first. And if you're just on a searcher in your portfolio, you can link to it directly by going to research and then stock research. Okay. Days above the SMA 50, 64. SMA 20 above the SMA 50, 57. Whopping earnings per share growth, it probably came out of nowhere, average volume 2 million shares. Other factors are probably going to be similar, but I didn't put in the volatility. I should have lowered the volatility to be 0 0.30 or less. Uh, let's plug that in. Let's go back to the uh, technicals there. Historical volatility less than 0.35. This might take everything out, of course, but let's take a look. Yep, just leaves the one. Okay. So, but that's how you would do it. If you have a stock that you like, you kind of want to match it to other stocks that have the same similar look based on uptrend. Use the quotes page here. You can just plug in the symbol and then click quotes. Or if you're already tracking it, go to research and then stock research. It's the same page. Get the SMA data stock uh, above the SMA 50 or SMA 20, how many days, MACD range, and so forth. Plug that into the search and you'll find like stocks against the position. All right, now, navigate over to the Married Put tab very quickly to handle our next question that came in. Before I take, your, take on the next question from David, I want to go down here very quickly. Okay, all right. All right, so, here we go. And of course, I'm sorry, one thing I should add, Mark says, thanks for the review of the, the stock uh, screener stock selector. You're welcome, Mark. It was from a different question. But as we just saw before, when you're in a search, whether it's for bull put credits or whether it's for long calls, there's about 25 to 30 different fundamentals and technicals that you can screen for. And there's about 30 to 40 different option criteria in every different strategy you can use. Remember to start off with just plug in the criteria that you know you want to look for for the strategy. If not, if you don't know, I should say, use one of our defaults as a stepping stone. The default searches we have in all the searches or even the picks of the day for things such as naked puts and covered calls are the starting points Ernie and I would use if we were opening one of those positions today. We'd still do our further research and analysis typically, but any default you see in the search for any strategy or if you see the picks of the day, that's our starting point for what we would use. And then you can make changes based on your specific needs and risk tolerance. All right, now to David. David trades radioactively exclusively. And he understands the income method number four adjustment requires what we call a debit ratio of less than 60%. I'm going to explain all of what that is in a minute. Okay, what percentage reduction of my maximum risk should I expect when I use an income method number four? Good question. I shoot for 50%, David, to answer your question right off the bat. The first time I'm using income method number four, I'm looking for a 50% reduction on the position. I take a look at my portfolios. Here's our straddle that we were looking at earlier, which did pretty much hit the full loss. Oh, no. Okay, good. It went back to 59.61. Am I on end of day? Oh, I'm 20 minute delayed. Okay, I'm sorry. This probably went to zero here, so let's just ignore that. Let me go check some of our radioactive positions. Oh, there's the AMD one. Perfect. Oh, th yeah, this is AMD. Different from the other stock. AMD, oh, it's up six points. That's way too much. That's not a good example. Give me a second here. Nothing good. No problem. Uh, no problem at all. I'm going to go back in time. And we're just, we're just going to put in a married put. Okay? So I'm going to put in a married put on Ollie. O L L I. And I'm going to say that I got into this position. Now, that's not, that's, I apologize. That's not a great one. We're, we're going to stick with Goose. Okay, but let's say that I got in sometime last month. And I got in at 56.50, near the low, recently. 
And at that time, I bought January, that would have been a 60. That's okay. I'm going to put in the January 60, and I probably would have paid maybe, yeah, 860 for it. Same date, 621. Okay, these are fake numbers. You're not going to be able to check these if you go back and look at the chart. But what I wanted to do with here is this one here at 5650, the stock's now up 5.5%. The put would have been much more expensive. That's not fair. Let me edit the position. I read it wrong. I apologize. I'm actually going to say that we paid 1090 for it. Okay, so it was four points in the money. It's out to January. It's a little bit volatility recently after the earnings. Probably wouldn't have been that high. Let's take a look at the profit and loss chart very quickly for this position. Okay, yeah, it's 11% risk. So I would have entered it. I'm sorry. There, I would have entered it there. Let's go. All right, 8.7, that's better. Now, the stock's right at about 60. Normally, I wait for it to go above, but this is just a tenuous example, David. If I was using income method number four, I'm going to roll the put up in strike. And the first two rules that we look for, following the rules in the blueprint, in this case, I'm just going to keep a standard, keep the same month. I'm going to sell to close the 60 and buy to close the 65. Naturally, the 60 put lost money, but it lost less than what I gained on the stock. I still could liquidate the position now for a profit. Okay, so I'm going to close this for about midpoint of 840, and I'm going to pay 1125. And this is going to be about a $3 debit. So we're going to sell to close our existing put, kind of a little bit of a loss. We're going to buy to open the higher strike put. My original risk was 575 or 8.7%. Now, this gives me what I want. The debit here is actually under $3. So my debit to strike ratio is good. It's under $3. It's $215. I'm sorry, $285 is my debit. But what am I getting by paying that debit? A five point higher payout. So I'm under. The 60% ratio, if it's under $3, that's fine. The risk didn't really lower by 50%. I would have liked to have seen that down by a 4.4, 4.3%, okay? But that didn't happen. Does that mean this is not a good play, David? No. What I want to see is a 50% reduction. And if I wait and GOOS goes above 60, it goes to maybe 61, I'm going to get less back for this, but I'm going to pay much less for this, deeper in the money put. So I'm going to get a lower debit, still the five point higher, and I might get that down to the 4.5, 4.4 range that I want. This one hasn't hit the strike price yet. That's why I'm not seeing the 50% reduction. But that's typically what I look for. The two things, the debit to strike difference ratio of less than 60 and also 50% reduction if possible. So that's, uh, David, that's the short answer. Now, if I couldn't get it in January, I could also move it in closer and go to the higher strike price, and then I'd be uh, lowered much, but I'd have much, much less time on the position. But those are generally my two rules of thumb, but there's a lot more in the blueprint that discusses when to do that and how to do that. I know you already have it, David, uh, but for others out there, there's a lot more that's involved with that, but those are the two general rules I look for, and I wouldn't be rolling this one right now, as I mentioned. All right. Moving on to Jonathan, do you have any guidelines for adjusting a near the money short put trade, naked put trade, where the underlying stock moves the option into the money? Okay, yes. First answer, Jonathan, is if you go to the free webinar section, do this later this weekend, go to option strategies, you'll see many archived webinars here in the option strategy section for managing your spread, spread positions, debit spreads, credit spreads, calendars, covered calls. Further down the line, introduction to naked puts and managing your naked put positions. We talk about the different ways to do it. Okay. Now, your question though is maybe a little bit different. 
those are for if the stock falls against you, it goes just unexpectedly against you, or just gradually move down. But you're saying if it suddenly, it kind of goes against you right here, was at the money, near the money, and then it just ended up being in the money, what do we do? Okay, since we know the price, I'm going to stick with GOOS, and again, let's say that for today, um, maybe earlier in this week, sometime I had sold the, oh, it would have to be the 60, right? Yeah, I sold the 60 put for 85 cents. Don't know when that would have happened, but let's say sometime this week, maybe when it peaked today, you know, we saw this morning it did that, maybe a bad idea to sell a put at that time when it bounced up to 60, uh, 145. But anyway, let's say we sold this for 85 cents, 1.4% yield for a 10-day or 5-day trade. Looks pretty good, but now the stock's down to 59.61. Okay, Jonathan, what am I going to do to manage this position? What are my options? Okay, number one, in this scenario, I'm likely just buying to close the put at or near 4 o'clock, before 4 o'clock, but at or near 4 o'clock. Why? I have the 60 put, and now it's slightly in the money, but it's only in the money by 39 cents. Okay, I've got 85 for it, so in this case, I would probably just close this leg of GOOS. I'd still make some profit, you know, maybe 0.9 maybe 1% because I'm losing roughly 40 cents, so I'm still making a 45 cent profit. If it's at a loss, okay, if it's further down and it was more than 85 cents, I still might close the position. Okay. When would I look to adjust it? Well, I usually look to adjust my naked puts or my short put and my bull put spread if the stock reaches within one or maybe 0.5% of that put strike price. Okay. So if the stock hit 60.60, maybe I sold it when it was at 61.45 today, but then the stock fell down today and it hit 60.60 at one point or maybe 60.30, even if it was a loss, I'd probably buy to close the put. Okay, just close it, get out of it, even if it's for a small loss, don't allow it to become a larger loss and continue to move against you. I would have done that any time during this week during the trade. Now, a common answer is to close the position, I buy to close my short put here, in this case for only 39 cents, so I still make a profit, and then just roll it down to say the 59 strike for next week, or the 58 strike two weeks out, or maybe even the 58 strike three weeks out. Give it a little bit more room, give it more time, roll for a credit. I'm not a fan of just doing that out of the blue because I'm losing on this position. I was wrong on the direction of the stock. I thought it was going to stay above 60. Clearly it didn't. It's dropped from 61.45 down to 59.61. I'm wrong on the direction of the stock. So if I roll down to another naked put at the 58 strike and the stock keeps falling, now I may have to just adjust that one again. Is it a bad idea to roll down a position to lower strikes and further out in time? Or in a bull put credit spread? to roll it down in strikes and further out in time. No, it's not a bad idea, but before you do that, re-evaluate the entire stock chart, the company information, any news you can find, just as you would have done when you opened the original position. Don't roll for the sake of rolling because it's what's taught and it's what's out there. You were wrong on the direction of the stock. Re-evaluate the stock chart. Would you open a new naked put if this just came up on your list? with the current chart, the trends, the news. If not, don't roll it. Close it, follow the search pattern on power options that you're using, and just open a new position altogether. Just open a new naked put for next week rather than trying to manage goose with goose, which is going in the wrong direction. Okay, so if you, oh, I'm sorry, folks. Hold on one moment. I apologize there. I forgot to turn off the phone. In any case, Rolling legs is fine. Rolling down is fine in this case, but remember, reevaluate the stock. If you wouldn't open a new naked put or bullish position on it today, don't roll it just for the sake of rolling to manage this position. Close it, take the loss, make it back with new positions that are showing more bullish trends. All right, number four. Are you still bullish on the stock? Do you have the capital that you'd be willing to put in the position? Take assignment on this naked put here. I'm still at a profit. Remember, if I take assignment, my cost basis 
is going to be 59.15, 85 cents below the 60 strike. I'm still at a gain. I could turn around and sell to close the stock on Monday or most likely convert it to a covered call or a collar to continue the position going forward. So I'm answering this based on the stock being right at the money, near the money, but goes slightly in the money. And here's a good example. 60 put that today was as high as 61.45, but then dropped down to 59.61. I might have closed it right before the end if I don't have a bullish expectation of the stock. If I still think the stock's going to recover and is still in a bullish trend, today was a little bit of a hiccup or an aberration, I may roll down to lower strikes and further out in time, or I may take assignment, convert it to a covered call, or into a collar. Or, in this case, if the stock fell and I don't have a bullish sentiment going forward, I was wrong in the direction of the stock, this time I don't have a bullish sentiment, I'm going to close it and I'm going to open new positions that have the criteria I want rather than trying to continue the goose position, continue selling puts on goose that's going in the wrong direction and I don't have a bullish sentiment. All of those ideas and more are discussed in more detail in that uh, Naked Put Management webinar. So again, you can just go to the free webinars page, go to the Options Strategies tab, scroll down here. I know it's from 2015, but it's the exact same criteria an exact same discussion I would have as I'm presenting it today. Uh, managing your naked put positions. It also talks about ways to use the stock repair tool and power options to help if you put the stock at a lower price. Okay. All right. So that's those ideas. Remember, this is a public page too, folks. It's just powerop.com slash webinars.asp. Don't have to be logged into the position to access it. Okay. Sorry, folks, quick iced tea break. Our next question, that was for Jonathan. Our next question is coming from Alex. Alex says, SPY strangle. So we're in a similar position, which is uh, 35 days to expiration. A similar position to what we discussed a moment ago, earlier in the presentation. Uh, wings to define risk at two, what? I'm sorry, Alex. Wings to define risk at $2 wide Selling for 175 premium with expectation to roll on tested side. Viable. Um, okay, so I think I misunderstood you first, Alex. No problem. My first misunderstanding was that um, I thought you're doing a long strangle here. It looks like you're doing a short strangle. Okay, so you want to go $2 wide on the strike prices and get a $1.75 premium. You're too close to the stock price. Uh, even on SPY, and you said, with roll to the untested side, is this viable? Off the top of my head, I'm going to say no. I don't think long term you're going to get the value you want out of the spread. I don't even know if you're going to find many of these types of spreads, but let's take a look. Short strangle. Selling for premium. A neutral position. Oh, sorry, folks. A neutral position with no outside wings as you would have in an iron condor. So we do have some great rules, some simple rules to set up. Let's set up the search to see what we can find, Alex. I'm going to clear out the filters. I am going to go all expirations. And I'm going to cheat this as best I can. We're going to go 32 to 37. Oops, sorry, folks. 32 to 37 days to isolate 35 days out in time. On this particular one, I'm going to set my maximum risk. I thought I had a, a risk field here. Applied volatility, liquidity. Okay, that's all right. So I want a net credit of around, I'm going to say one, I'm going to give some breathing room. I'm going to say 160 to 190. Okay, so that's for the premium. Strike price, I'm not going to use that, and probability sum is irrelevant. Uh, out of the money range, I know I'm going to be pretty close to the stock price in this case. That is strange. I thought I had a risk field here where I could set the strike difference range. Return, probability sum. Well, I guess I probably can. I'm looking for about a 90% return. Oh, no, that's different, isn't it? Because it's based on the margin. Bummer. Okay, and I'd have to think on that for a moment, but that's okay. We've got the basic credits in, 
and then I just want to search by SPY. So let's see how many strangles this pulls up for us. Too many, 47. And I'm all over the map with strike differences, aren't I? So here's a 305, 268. That's not cutting it. And the returns are small. So I want to see a return. I think I am right. I think I want to go to return of about greater than 80% or so. Let's see if there's any in this list. Nope. I'm sorry. Maybe I meant eight because of the margin. Let's try eight. The lower the strike different. No, that's not going to give it to me. I'm sorry. All right, so we'll do it this way. I'm just going to go call strikes out. Less than two. Put strikes out less than two. That's strange. That shouldn't... Oh, okay. You want to be much further out. Yeah. Let me do this. This percent out of the money range sort of reflects where the strikes are in relation to the stock price. But hey, you're talking about $2 strike differences. That, that's what's talking about, two wide wings. You know what? I'm sorry. Maybe I am reading you wrong. There we go. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I did read it wrong. You said a strangle, and then you said outer wings. I didn't read it right. That is an iron butterfly. My apologies, my sincerest apologies. I, I thought you meant you only wanted the strike differences of the straddle to be two points offset, not that you were doing the outside wings. Okay, no problem. Iron butterfly. Let's redo this. It'll be real quick. All right, now we've got it. Let's do this, Alex. Same scenario. I'm going to go into the search. We're going to clear the settings. This will have what I want. All expirations, again, let's try that, uh, what did I say, 32 to 37 days to expiration. Minimum net credit of about $1.75. Total net credit, $1.75. Now, I can do this two ways. Um, number one, I want same margin on both sides of the spread. All right, but I'm going to keep my maximum risk to less than two points, right? It's going to be less than $2 between the strikes. But you want a net credit of $175. And we just want it on SPY. Okay, so those filters again. We set our expiration time frame. I'm using all expirations anywhere from 32. Let's go to 39 just in case, 35 days out. I want a minimum net credit of $175, but I'm not letting that maximum risk actually be more than 150. Actually, I'm not going to let that be more than a dollar. That doesn't mean a dollar strike difference. That means that the net credit there, I could put 25 cents, and in fact, I should. I'm going to put 45 cents. That's what I should do. Okay, and I'm not going to worry about delta, anything else? No, no, no probabilities, no volume. All right, let's see what we've got. All right. So, Long put of 255, short put of two, oh, oh, okay. 265 to 265 to 280 to 255. Didn't get as close in as I wanted to. They're still 10 points apart to give us that $1.75 net credit. I don't think you're going to get the net credit you want with those strike prices. I think the cost of the options that are too below where we'd be selling, and that's at 265 are going to be too high. Let's take a look here. I'm just going to go quickly to the chain. Oh, oh, yeah, it's a good thing I did that. August is the 38 days away there. August 13th is what came up. Let me go to the chain. Was it August 1 that was 38? I'm sorry. Oh, no. August 13th, that's what it was. Okay. Oh, see, this only offers five. That's something I didn't think of. I apologize. We've got to go closer in. All right, let's try the 10th. Okay, yeah, so 35 days out. It's, it's right at 35. That, those should have come up. 32 to 37. I should have seen these. Okay. But could you get a credit? 
Remember, we were looking at the 265, but let's just take the at the monies. So let's just look at these numbers here. Let's call it 410 and 315 for the sales. 410, 315. So that's a credit in of 725. Okay, and going two full strikes apart. Uh, 273 for the put, 257. And 277, call, uh, 290. All right, so we're paying roughly 560, is that right? $5, yeah, about 550, about 550 or so uh, for that. So 725 minus 550, you're dead on target with your numbers, aren't you? You're at 175 credit using the 275s, 273 and the 277. Let's build it. I had a conversation with a gentleman. Uh, earlier today, uh, a customer of mine who calls in occasionally, Winston his name is, and Winston wanted to know about what I thought about iron butterflies. And I'll tell you what I feel about iron butterflies after I graph your position. We talk about can this be viable. I'm going to have to think about why these did not show up as they should have. They should have been in that search. So the August 10th was exactly 35 days away. I'm selling the two 275s. Buying a 273 put, you're two points apart, the 277. Okay. All right, so sell and sell, buy and buy. It's going to grab midpoints for us. It's going to be a fantastic looking return. Okay, low risk. That's right, but a fantastic return. Now, when I was having a conversation with Winston, he had mentioned that, you know, what are my takes on iron butterflies? And here's my honest answer I don't trade them. And although they have, this has a very low risk, and this is what you're looking for, over time, you know, you say you're going to manage one leg. Okay, so right now it's up, even if you did the 275.50s, which weren't there. But if the stock moves up, ETF moves up to 276 or 277, you said you're going to manage the short leg that's in trouble. You're going to roll the call. Well, you got a $1.83 net credit here. The stock's at 277 in the next week, you're probably going to be paying three or four dollars to buy it back, maybe five, and then you might get another three dollars by rolling the call up. But you can't sell a 277 because you can't be short and long the same one at the same time. Oh, sorry, folks. You can't be short and long the same one at the same time. So if it goes up to 276, 276.50, you may have to convert this to a debit spread. Now you're in a bull call debit and a bear put debit that you had to roll for a premium, and if the stock falls now, you lose on both. You lose on both bullish spreads. So you'd have to adjust this whole bear call side. You'd have to move this up and out, which is also going to cost you a debit, and it's going to lower the return on the position. If it keeps going up, now you're in an iron condor. Here's my problem with butterflies. Is this one a low risk? Yes. And you'd say, well, I would just open this up, wait 35 days, and Sometimes I'm going to win here, sometimes I'm going to win here, I might get close to here, and yeah, I'll have losses here and here. Overall, I should win. I can't guarantee that, to tell you the truth. 35 days is an awful long time period to expect this to be really neutral, and I mean plus or minus 1%. Here's my answer, honestly, on butterflies, folks. Even with management techniques in, even with having a plan for management ideas, even looking at the possible 1,076% return versus only a loss of $17. This long of a time frame, even on SPY. We've seen what SPY has done in the past month alone, let alone the past six months. Okay, there have been three distinctive downtrends. There have been two distinctive uptrends. Not conducive to butterflies over a 30-day time period at all. But anyway, not trying to lecture. I'm not that great of a stock picker, by the way. I'm right with what I want to do for married put positions, bull put credits, and so forth. Uh, but bull puts, usually I'm, I'm right. Uh, I think my average is 83, 84% of the time. Married puts, I want a stock that moves up 3 to 6% in the first 30 to 60 days, and I'm right about 60% of the time. It's really 65 um, for what I want to do. And if the ones don't move up 3 to 6%, they've moved up 2 or only dropped 1. My thoughts with butterflies. If you can pick stocks consistently that 
at a certain date will not be more than plus or minus 1% from your short strike legs at any date. So you can look out and say in 30 days this SPY will not be plus or minus more than 1% of 275.42. Or you can pick positions that say I know it's going to fluctuate but I know in 35 days around this expiration it's not going to be within plus or minus 1% of its current price. And you can do that accurately meaning 68, 70, 73% of the time. You have charts or techniques used that can pick stocks that do that. You don't need my help with trading and you could be successful in this strategy. If you can't consistently pick stocks 70% of the time or more that over a 10, 15, 20, 30 day period do not trade more than plus or minus 1% from the current price it's at when you're planning on entering a position, you will not be successful with this strategy, even with the management in mind, because the management is going to cost money, it's going to lower it, you're going to be in this loss range, which is very low, you're going to be in that loss range probably 70 to 75% of the time. And you say you manage it, but when you manage it, you're going to change the whole dynamic of this position. You're going to lower the overall return. Could you still be profitable? Maybe. But is it going to match your trading goals with the management in place as SPY moves up and down in the short strangle iron butterfly position? It's hard to tell. You can pinpoint time frames, Alex, where you could show me that this would have taken a portfolio that you had and made, you know, X amount of percent. And I can pick any other time period and show you that this same strategy could have lost you $40,000. Okay, and I'm thinking February 5th to February 9th, and then following right behind that, March 21st to April 5th. Okay, and Mark says, is, is this the corollary? Do you prefer one-sided credit spreads but not neutral-based credit positions? That is correct. I don't like butterflies. Honestly, I know I can be successful. I, I know people who are successful with all call butterflies, all put butterflies, and sometimes iron butterflies as well. They all have the same risk reward profile, okay? But they're better stock pickers than me. They're better timers than I am. They have a better management technique. I don't mess with this because I know I can't do this. And I'm not going to try. Am I missing out on profits? I don't know. I'm still doing okay with the other strategies I'm doing, so I don't feel the need to do this personally. I don't have the numbers to tell you, Alex. In the past two years, you could have tripled the gains that I made in my portfolio. You could have quadrupled them. I'm not even sure. Okay. But if you look at the chart of SPY over the last two years, it was lower left to upper right. This I'm answering along with Mark. I stopped trading iron condors two years ago completely because I was tired of closing and rolling the bear call side. Everything was bullish. Everything was moving up. Why not just do bull put credit spreads and bull call debit spreads? Why mess around trying to and the other idea was, okay, SPY at 275, we're seeing a two-year trend of SPY doing this before some of this and then some of this, okay? But this was the last two years. So back starting in around 2016, I stopped iron condors because I was sick of closing the bear call side. And you'd say, oh, well, that's okay. If SPY is at 275 and you think it's bullish, just do a 270, 268 bull put here but then increase it up and do a 295, 297, way out of the money, bear call. Why? Why even do that for four or five cents and pay commissions on it even if I'm doing 10 or 12 contracts? Why not just do the bull put with extra contracts? You know? So that's why I stopped doing iron condors altogether and I don't trade butterflies, Mark, in that, in that answer as well. Okay? Um, now, Alex mentions that, uh, you know, looking at that, uh, you use the probabilities, and that's true. You can find the good probabilities, but remember, the probabilities are the probabilities that the stock would be between the upper and lower break even for some profit, not the probability at max profit. That's key, because if you're trying to develop a trading plan and saying, okay, I expect to make $165 versus every $17 I can lose, and if I'm right 60% of the time, you might see a potential 
a portfolio using the trade simulator tool, that would be up 10,000%. But you're not getting this 60% of the time. You're getting something in here, here, over here, here, one or two here, but probably 80 to 90% of your winners are in here, and that's just of the winners. All the losers, you're probably close to that 17. So now it's different. You're not making 165 to 17. You might be making 45 cents to risk 17, which is still fantastic. But again, if you can keep that 60% range, where SPY doesn't move more than two set more than two points from where it is now, or dollar 83 from where it is now, that's the key. Okay, so that's why it's tough in these situations. Okay. And, and volatility is pulled back, so they're a little bit lower, too, um, as well. And you're shooting for 25%, Alex goes on to say. That's good. That's good. Okay. Um, Follow-up question here before I get into Bill's question and Rajiv, I think. Um, oh, Rajiv says you can use a call or put butterfly with direction in mind out of the money where it still costs less. So he's saying that instead of doing a butterfly right at the money, if you were bullish, you could do something like this with the 278 to 270, you know, 278. So you're, you're going for a bullish structure here to move up and be near the max profit if you pinpoint the stock price. But Rajiv, again, the reason why that's a good point, it's a very valid point if you can do that. But again, if I can't pick where the stock's going to be trading one or one and a half percent to this price, I'm not going to be able, me personally, I can't say that in 35 days the stock's going to be with one or one and a half percent of 278 either. <laughs> I know a lot of people claim to have stock uh, selection services and um, timing service, prediction services, and so forth. But uh, I don't. I personally don't have that. Okay. All right. So that was pretty much that. And then we've got Rajiv's got three questions. But before we get to Rajiv, I've got Bill very quickly. Uh, I've got Bill and Rose. I'm sorry, Rajiv. Right before you is Bill and Rose. Um, Bill says, whenever there's an expiration Friday, I always look for naked puts on fast rising stocks, like buying with a discount. Similar, oh shoot, sorry, Bill. Similarly, when I'm trying to dispose of a stable bullish stock, I look for a good call to sell so that I get an edge on the sales price. Um, I haven't been able to use power options to find these for me, even if I have a ticker in mind. The search summary at the top right shows nothing when I just want to quickly find the best deal. Any suggestions? Don't do the, use the search summary. The, the search summary is just based on your, your stock price, and it has um, it's looking for covered calls and more. You want to what you want to do individually, Bill, is you want to set up a covered call search. Okay, so you're going to set up two searches. You're going to set a naked put and a covered call search. And what you're going to do is you're going to set a one day out search. All right. I, I can't do it today, of course. Ooh, I can. Can I? Yeah, okay. All right. So I'm going to go to July 5th. I, I'm going to start off with a default search. I should have done the other way first, but I'm going to start off with a default search and then change it, okay? So use two searches. Don't use the search summary. Even if you know a stock, Okay, don't use this. So I would just use the option chain. Whenever I look for a cover call or naked put on a stock I mentioned, I just go to the option chain and look at the prices because we show you the percent return if assigned downside protection or more. But you can set up a search for this. So let me clear the filters. Oh, this is not going to be a great idea. But okay, I, I went to the fifth because uh, I can't select the sixth yet. But anyway, I'm going to clear the filters. Uh, Zero to three days, so we're going to run this as if it was on Friday, but it's going to be using closed data from Thursday. Uh, I want a decent return for a one-day trade, max percent if assigned. We're probably going to call that 0.3. Uh, downside protection is probably going to be 0.2. I want some decent premium. Option bid price, hopefully greater than 25 cents. Open interest, yes. I want to make sure that they're active. Option volume today. Okay. And zero to three days, those returns might, you could put them higher, but in the fundamentals, stock price, I'm going to put in my range for what I can afford. Stock change today is greater than, you said shoot up, so let's go $1.45 or at least, oh, no, it doesn't have to be that, at least 0.5%. And, you know, I might do not between now and expiration for earnings and so forth. 
So this might take a minute because I know we're loading the background history there, Bill. But there we go. All right, so there's a bunch of trades here. There's actually 112. Um, ProShares, Halter, Q, I should have weighed that. But Wayfair, 117. My apologies, Bill. One last thing. You want it to be slightly in the money. I forgot about that. You want to be slightly in the money to try to get a sign. So let's try that. This will cut us down by half, maybe. 71, okay. OLED is up 415. So the 87.70, the 87.5 gives you 1.2% return. A trade desk, 92.70. These are right at the money, okay. Some of them are one point below. But anyway, let's take a look here. So this was all would have jumped up on Thursday. That's what my search would have found. These 71 trades, the top 15. This is what it would have found with those jumps on Thursday for Friday expiration. But that search I just created for covered calls would have found the ones that gapped up Monday, or, pff, gapped up Monday, gapped up Friday morning with that percentage I was looking for in the stock change and the stock move today. I would run the search after about 10 at 9.45, 9.50 Eastern time and set my settings. Now, Again, because it was a day later, I don't know if these would have worked out today. If some things pulled back, some things stayed up, but let's take a look. And you do the same thing with a naked put. You could just go right at the money or naturally out of the money, but look for positions with the gap up where you're out of the money for the naked put and it still offered some return. This is what's going to take a long time. But I wouldn't use the search summary. If you want to look at a strike price that matches what you want, Bill, just go to the call chain or go to the put chain in my opinion, and just look for those as well. Um, because we show you all the returns you need for naked puts and covered calls on the call chain and on the put chain. All right. Not great, but kind of terrible. 50-50 win-loss ratio in this case, about 9 out of 15, 60%. Still made a positive percent return. I know we would have opened all of these. You might have looked for the ones that had the uh, highest open. But 60% win ratio for an average return of 0.1% on those covered calls. And they could have rolled the others or just closed them as well. All right. No, Mark, this is covered calls and naked puts. Okay, we're not talking about married put positions. We're talking about covered calls and uh, out of the money naked puts for premium, not uh, married puts. All right, so Rose, real quick. Um, all right, so that's that one as well. Um, what I can do. Okay, real quick. I'm sorry. Let me save this here in the history. One day test. I don't need a description. All right. Why am I doing this? Well, let's see what would happen last week. So, July, no, June 29th, one-day test. Oh, no, this, that, that won't work. That won't work. I'm, okay. Well, let's try it. We got 17 results. I don't think this is the best way to do it because it's using the closing prices and intrinsic value because it's the history is a day late, so I can't really do this. I'll have to test this next Friday to get an accurate depiction. So let me make a note of that there, Bill. Test these searches, one day CC, NP, next Friday, 945 a.m. All right, so I'm going to run that, have to run that test next week, see what we come up with. I can also do it during the day and then see what the end results were, but this is what I would do. If you already know the stock, just use the call chain or the put chain. You can create a search to find the positions that you want, in this case, Bill, um, just using that one day. You know, zero to three days, run the search on Friday, minimum return, some minimum premium, slightly in the money, and you'd go slightly out of the money with a naked put, and you'd be using naked yield. All right, very quickly, Rose's question before we get to Rajiv's. Um, Rose says, uh, I am in a bull put for July, uh, 1700 it looks like. Oh, which July? I'm sorry. July 20th. Good, good. 1700. 
It looks like a widespread. 1700 to 165, so the 1650s. Pretty 50 point spread, pretty wide 50 point spread. Okay. Um, Okay, now I don't know what you would have gotten here when the stock was at what price, so I'll just go one and one. I know you did eight. There rose, uh, oh, 1695, okay. I saw 170, you had 170 and 165, so I just uh, assumed that we were talking in uh, one tenth. Let's clear that out, 1695, good enough, good enough, good. Now I don't know what premium you got, but a decent premium on a five point spread is usually around 50 to 60 cents or so, around 11 or 12% return, might have been a little bit higher because it was further out in time. So let's sell this for 275. Let's buy this one for 210. An unrealistic, well, probably 225. An unrealistic price, but it would have been 20. But in any case, this gives us the premium that we've got with that. Okay, so again, you're worried that the stock might fall below 1700. What are your options? Now, I'm going to go to big charts here, but I'm going to change it to three months and daily. There we go. Okay, so it's yeah, it's had a MACD crossover to the negative, but it looks like it's trying to pull back. RSI is coming back up. So it's, it's shown the weakness. You've seen the weakness here, but it's trying to pull back up, but you're close. We, all, we can all see that. We know how fast Amazon moves. All right. So my apologies. Here we are. What are your options? Now, normally, um, in, my, in the webinar that we have for managing the bull put spreads, go the same thing we did for Jonathan. Number one, you can close out the position for a loss. If you're concerned about it, why would you do that now if you could still go further up in price? Well, because you're worried about further losses. You've got a 160 net credit, much better than I put in, but that's okay. But you have a 160 net credit, so you could close it now. Sorry right, about that. Okay. Twenty eighty dollar twenty, so sixty cents. So twenty three ten maybe to close the short and you'd get twenty one twenty or so back. Twenty one twenty. So this would be if you liquidated the whole position right now, I'm looking at a loss of about two dollars to close it, a debit of about $2 to close it at midpoint. Okay, so this would be, this is a dollar ten apart, so it'd be about twenty-one twenty here, and as I mentioned, uh, twenty-three ten. Oh, okay, so you're looking, yeah, you're looking at about $2, but you keep the 160 net credit, so this is only a loss of 40 cents if you liquidated now. Okay, so number one is close, and only take the loss of about 0 0.40, 0 0.45. We'll have to wait till we'll see what Monday open is. It could jump back up, and then you could feel better, or it could jump back down, and we'd be at a worse position. One of my normal roles is, say, just to roll the short down one leg, but you can only do that if you left this two points apart. And I'm not saying you should do a 10-point spread if that doesn't match your moneyness. But when I have dollar point strike differences on stocks, I usually go two points apart. So one of my management is I can just roll from, let's say, the 1700 down to the 169,750 without moving the long just to give myself a little bit more room. You don't have that option. Okay, so we're just going to not be able to roll down the short by itself. Number three, you could close and only have a 40 cent loss. And what makes sense here is if you're still bullish on Amazon, roll down. Okay, this is one where it makes sense. You're only taking about a 210 debit to close this spread. You keep the 160, so you got a 40 or 50 cent loss. Roll down to say maybe even the 1650 to 1645, and you'll probably get more than that 50 cents. Okay, so close and roll down to give yourself more time. So here you are at 1700, 1695. Roll it down. You'll be at a lower profit but you'll have a much higher probability of the stock staying above 1650 by July expiration. Um, number four, of course, you could just, out of turn here, instead of closing and rolling down, if you think the stock's going to continue to move down, naturally just close, take the 40 cent loss, and then make it back up with other bull put spreads on stocks you're more bullish on. Number five, um, there's no point converting this to an iron condo right now. You could, so you could help 
the break even by maybe selling something out of the money here, like a 1740 to a 1745 for about another dollar net credit. But that doesn't help you if it drops down to 1697 or 1696 even. You're still taking a bigger loss on this part of the spread that's being threatened. So creating the iron condor right now, I don't like. I don't think that's not helping protect this position. It's giving you a little bit of a credit, but it's not giving you any protection for this one. <sighs> Six is tricky. I don't like it in this case because these are so expensive, but you haven't lost anything too much here yet. Number six, buy to close the short for the expensive 23.10 and leave the long put open. So now you have a long put with a cost basis of 23.10 minus 160. So if you think Amazon will continue down, Right? You've, you've knocked this down about 2150, right around where it's trading. But if Amazon keeps pulling down, you have a long put that you're profiting on. But remember, your break even is 2250. Okay, that's what you got to watch out for for that long put at 1695. So close the short and leave the long open. What's the catch? If it rebounds and jumps back up and this loses eight or nine points, you're taking probably triple the loss you would take on the bull put itself. That's a big danger. That's an aggressive play. You really have to be bearish on Amazon to do that. Number seven is the pendulum adjustment where I would move the long to a higher strike to create a bear put debit. Only do that when the stock is between the strike prices, at least below the short put. The pendulum adjustment does not make sense. I don't know what you're willing to risk. Uh, and what your outlook is. I don't know if six is the right move right now. It only works if it moves down. I don't think doing the iron condor is a good move right now. So what are your options? Do nothing and wait. See what happens Monday. That's one that's not up here. Do nothing. Close and take a 40 cent loss and then keep with your bull put spread criteria. Open a new position and make that back with other stocks. Number three, close and roll down. Number two, just roll down one strike doesn't work. So you're looking at closing and taking the loss, doing nothing, closing and rolling down the spread, or of course just closing and it, one in four kind of the same rows in this situation. I don't think the iron condor is a good idea because you could lose on the upside if it rebounds. I don't think um, closing the short at this time and paying the $2,000 times, or I'm sorry, $200 times eight contracts and then hoping that it continues down and trying to make it up with the long is necessarily the best play here. We're gonna have to look at this Monday, see what's going on. And then of course the pendulum adjustment is not a good idea either, okay? All right, so gotta get to Rajiv now. He's been very patient. Okay, so Rajiv starts off, um, let me clear out these drawings. Rajiv starts off with you're interested in Walmart. Look like Walmart starts showing contraction. Is it a good time for debit spread or diagonal uh, with 45 to 62 before earnings? Uh, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't really analyze charts um, on these on these webinars and give basis. Is this a good idea for a position? I, I can't give any direct advice on what I think a chart looks good or doesn't look good. Uh, is it contracting? Yes. Does it look more negative to me than positive right now? Yes. It's below the 20-day moving average. Just crossed the MACD lower. The RSI is weakened, although it's trying to stabilize, but hasn't crossed below the lower Bollinger Band yet, but it just crossed below the SMA 20 is holding there. It's contracting, but it's got a negative MACD. I'd say this is more bearish than it is bullish right now. Is it a good play before earnings? I don't know. Okay. I, I know your strategy to do that around earnings, but I think this is more bear than a bull in that case. Um, now, you did the same thing. You looked at Bank of America, which is similar. Earnings in 10 days, bought a call for the 29 strike. Should you convert it into a calendar for, tw for five cents to reduce the cost? Well, you're, you're at 29 on BAC. And you bought a, a deep out of the money. Tw you bought a 29 call for 18 cents. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, I mean, you, you could try to sell it for 29. I, I don't know if I... I, I can't predict where the stock's going to be, but again, this one looks bearish to me. So if you're able to get the five cents, then um, there you go. You know, you can get five cents, and if it continues down uh, as it's starting to look, then you keep the five cents, but you're going to lose more on the long. You might want to cover it with a put 
depending on what cost you can get. And then your third follow-up question on this line of thought was THC looks like the perfect chart. Okay, well, let me go more than a month, right? Oh, I'm one, oh, still in one day. Jeez, I apologize there. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Well, THC, looking at the statistics, uh, looking at the criteria is still bearish right now. It hasn't crossed back above the SMA 50, but it's trying. Six months, is that a better look? Nah, a lot of volatility. It's, it's had good growth here. It was, it was doing good here, but there were some pullbacks, some bad entry times, consolidation, gap up probably from earnings or some other event, but I think it's struggling. I think it's negative right now. I don't think it's coming back up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I can't give that kind of advice, but I would not open a married put with this stock right now as a bullish position. I would not open a long call personally with this stock right now. You guys know what I look for. I would have done it here. Uh, let me highlight that if it's not there. I'd have done a married put or a long call here. Um, here, perhaps, and here. I'm not doing one here. Now, if this crosses over in the next five days, then yes, I would do a married put or a long call at that point. But right now, it's not above the 20. It's not a MACD positive crossover. The RSI is weakening but trying to show strength. But at this point, I wouldn't treat this as a bearish, a bullish position yet for me. And I might miss the wagon. I might miss the low price. But then again, we'll have to see. All right. That was Rose's question there. Okay, so let's go back to your other two. You know, you'd mentioned also BAC and Walmart. I was looking at the daily chart. I had forgotten that I had saved it that way. Yeah, see, I, I don't know. It's consolidated. I, I, I'm, I would not feel confident personally doing my types of calendars going four or five months out in time. Uh, and selling a one-month or two-month call against this right now. Um, that's just based, you've seen on how I read these things, uh, how I look at charts, and that doesn't mean it's the best way, that doesn't mean it's the right way, but what's worked for me in the past, you know, we saw this consolidation last time, it did go positive here with the MACD, but it looks like it wants to go negative again. You just have to wait and see. And would you ask me, would I look for a calendar spread on this position, a bullish position? No, I wouldn't. BAC, no. And I don't think it's bottom. I, I can't tell, but I don't think it's bottomed out yet. Okay, you, you read charts differently than I do, so you might be saying that you're looking at a bottom here, and uh, I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Um, hold on here. So is that? I think that was all of your your, your questions there, Rajiv, and related to that THC. We looked at the chart, um, BAC and WMT there as well. Mark, the potential roll down of the short would be for a debit, right? Yes. Uh, but rolling down the whole spread is also for a debit too. Uh, no, rolling down the spread will likely be done for a credit. You're trying to get a credit. Now, you'd pay more for it. Um, let's use that other example instead of Amazon. Let me go to the chain again. And we want to go to the chain for Monday. Fifty nine sixty one. Are you higher than that? Oh, is it fifty eight eighty eight? Okay, whatever. No problem. No problem at all. Bull put spread. We're gonna do the fifty nine fifty. Yeah, we're gonna do the. No, let's do the fifty nine fifty seven. Okay, 59 at a dollar, 57 at 45. That's way too much, but okay. We're, we're just going to do that spread there. I'm going to take a look here. Shoot, okay. So, Mark, on GOS, let's say on Monday, I opened that... Uh, today's... Okay, Leah, let's say... I opened the 59, I'll just do it this way, 59, 15, 57, 50, and I got 20 cents, okay? Whatever it was at the time. All right, now, today as I got closer to expiration with the stock at 59.61, I got threatened. I'm really sorry. 
Let's reverse this. Better. All right, 10 cents. Okay. Wow, I have never seen that fill in a zero before. I don't know if I put that in by mistake. Thank you, now I'm happy. Not really. Let's make it a little higher. Okay, anyways, here we go, Mark. Now, my two options. Let's, this was originally a 13% max profit or 7% return. The prices are gonna look weird because it's the July 6th, but think about it this way, okay? What about just rolling down one leg? Because I left myself two points apart. Okay, so 59.61. I've got a buy to close this for 10. Oh, the prices are all screwy again. Okay, let me get everything out of here. I'm gonna go out. I gotta go out one week. I'm sorry about that. I should have just done that from the beginning. Uh, 59.50, 57.50. Again, I'm going to keep about a 20. I'm going to do a 20 cent profit this time. I'm sorry, Mark. 59.50 at 30, at 10. Okay. Now, did this maybe when the stock was at 60? Stocks pulled back. I'm looking for that 11.1 percent return, but I'm right at the short put. Yes. If I buy to close this and sell to open the 58.50, roll down one strike, it's going to be at a debit. Now, I have to pay attention. You're right, Mark, because I can only do this if it can be done at a credit, meaning that the original credit I received is higher than the debit I have to pay. If it's not, this can't be done. And this one looks like it's not going to work. What do I mean by that? I'm going to buy this for about 115 and sell this for about 58.50. So I'm paying a debit of 20 cents close to it, or 30 cents, but I've only gotten, okay, this is 40 cents, but I only took 20 cents in, so now this is a negative. I should have mentioned this to you, Rose. This, you, you had mentioned, Rose, already that you were thinking of number one now, just closing it. You have to wait to see it Monday. Rolling down the put can work, but you have to graph it first. You're right, Mark. I should have mentioned that because if the debit that you pay to roll it down one strike is higher than the original net credit, there's no point to doing this. Rolling the whole spread out would also do the same thing. So we're going to buy to close this at 125. We're going to sell to close our 57.50 for about 56 cents. Okay, so we took in 20, paying about 70. We've got a debit of 52.50. Now, now when I say roll down, of course, it's with the caveat that yeah, you only roll down if you make a profit out of it. So now I need to roll out in time and down in strike. Let's go to the 27th. Okay, so I close my original spread, the 59.50, 57.50, because I'm in with that 1%. I took in 20 cents, but I had to pay 70 cents to close it, so I'm about a cost of 50 cents. The next spread I open, 58 to say 56, better be at least 50 cents or I'm not going to profit. And at midpoint, it looks like it is, but what you may find doing in this case, Mark, is you started with a two-point spread in order to roll for a credit, you might have to go to a four-point spread. Increase the margin in order to get the credit for rolling out. Okay, so we close all these, and then let me go ahead and sell this and buy this. See there, I'm getting about a dollar net credit almost. Puts us back in a credit of 43 cents, but that's still only 7.7%. But at least I'm at the 58 strike now instead of at 59.50. But it will cost you a debit to close, but you're, you're, you're paying for that debit to close and the difference of what you already collected. You've got to factor that in, too. But, yes, rolling down will be done at a debit on the bull put sign. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Bill, I don't honestly have a great answer for this question. Um, Bill says, You've, I've been decimated by prior bad advice. I like the idea of married puts, but I can sell them afford them due to the cost basis. And the risk-reward ratio is lousy. The risk-reward ratio is actually one of the best that you can get because you know that you can't lose any more than 4 or 5%, where in other positions you're losing 100%. 
And you could say, oh, it's only $2 in a credit spread. Yes, but it's 100% of what you're investing. This is where investors get into trouble, Bill. It's not just the fact that you can say, and that we can say easily, and I would agree with you, an iron condor, an iron butterfly, a bull put credit spread, bull call debit spread, bear put debit spread, and, and so forth, and all those lines, it has a known risk that is true. Anyone who says it's low risk is incorrect in my opinion. The, the, the butterfly we looked at earlier that only had the 17 cent risk was low risk, but has a low, that strategy by itself over time has a low expectancy of profit because you're going to be taking losses much more than you're going to be taking gains and you're very rarely going to be taking the maximum gain if ever. It's deceiving. Okay. But remember, we could say on this original credit spread, let's just take a look at it. Our original bull put credit spread here, we have a potential for an 11% return and we're only putting up $180 as opposed to buying goose at $59.50, $59.60, paying $5,950 and then going on it. You're risking 100% of what you invest. That's where everyone gets into trouble. Okay, As disciplined as everyone says they're going to be. You've got $5,000 of free capital to open a few spreads. You're not going to trade one contract of this. You're going to trade five. That's $900. That's one-fifth of your portfolio or the, what you're allocating with the $5,000. And I know it's, it's more than that. I'm just saying as an example, I have $5,000. I do five contracts. That's $900. That's one-fifth, one-sixth of my total portfolio. Goose has a bad week and drops three points. I'm at full loss. 900. Can I manage it? Yeah. But to make back that $900 loss or this 180 loss when I'm looking to make 20 might take as many as 9 or 10 trades. Or if I stick with Goose and I roll out for the sake of rolling, I might have to roll out to November or January in order to get the credit to make this back. And as we just saw, it's going to have to be wider strike prices, which means more margin, less contracts and potentially more risk if you add more money into it. It's 100% of what you invest. It is a known risk. That does not mean it is low risk. So, dear question to me is, what can you do with lower capital that's better? Anything that uses lower capital can be argued that it's, a, how do I want to say this, can be argued that it's a better use of your money, can you do more trades? A lot of people here online, Rajiv, Sam, others, we've been talking about spreads, Rose, uh, many others, they're doing these leverage positions because they don't want to put that much money into the positions. But where are we all getting trapped occasionally? That. This. It's known risk, not low risk, because you're risking 100% of what you invested into the position. Okay. That's all said and done. What's better? <sighs> Bull puts might be a good idea. I don't think butterflies are a good idea because look at the structure of the trade. Look at what we did earlier today. You're not going to get that peak most of the time. You're not going to get that peak 10% of the time probably. You're going to get outside on the wings in that varied profitability range. Uh, we even said earlier that the we were looking for maximum of a 25% of that peak gain, which might still be profitable long term. But there was only a four-point movement before you hit the loss. That's really tough to do on a $270 ETF over a 35-day time period. It is extremely neutral. Iron condors give you wider breadth, wider upper and lower break even, but two ways to lose, bear side and bull side. Mar your broker likely won't require you to do two margins, but they might. Okay, That's the key. Now, taking another step back. Diagonal spreads is something I am fond of, but again, I'm buying a call that's three to six months out in time and selling near-term calls against it or doing strangles with it to protect the downside, but again, I'm risking 100% of whatever I paid for that call minus the first premium I collect. If I overtrade and do 10, 12, 20 contracts, I'm still risking one-fourth to one-fifth of the total portfolio. That's the danger. That's the lie of leverage. So... I've seen enough, I, I'm trying to get, get you to a point here, but I've done 
various webinars where I've shown that even if you're doing credit spreads, which have the known risk, you have to keep in mind that you're risking 100% of that. And if you're looking for spreads with an 80% probability, you're looking for something along these lines, an 11% potential profit, you know, 20 cents on a two-point spread, 50 cents on a five-point spread, that's 11.1% potential profit 80% of the time. You look for 80% probability. Whenever I run the simulations, you have to assume that you are going to take losers. You, cannot, you, you don't want to take the full loss, but sometimes it's just going to break through both strike prices and you're going to take the full loss. 100% loss just wiped out 10 previous gains. On the other hand, you would be managing it, so hopefully you never take more of a 50% loss. But even if you did that, if you make 11% when you're right, you lose 50% of an investment amount when you're wrong, you don't need to be right 80% of the time. You need to be right about 85, 84% of the time in order to profit long term. You can profit extremely well if you're right 93% of the time. Not many people are. Very few. Okay? And even invest, I know there's other services out there that claim that they've had a 93% success rate since February 10th. Someone actually is touting that they have a 90% success rate since February 10th trading options, trading spreads. They tout it as three month, six month, four month, four month, 93% success rate or something along those lines. And I just thought, yeah, what did you just do? You took out all of the bull put spread at spreads you were trading from end of January to February 9th, which all took a loss of probably 50 to 100%, which probably is five times more than the gains you made over the last four months with your 93% success rate. And Bill says no hope then. No, Bill, it's not that there's no hope. I'm trying to educate you on what the risks are. You can be successful with bull put credit spreads. You probably can be successful with iron condors. But think of the kind of headline market they're in. What is the bane of these spreads, whether you go directional or whether you do an iron condor. It's volatile movements from an unexpected event, an unexpected headline, an unexpected news article. Someone opens their mouth, geopolitical outside. You get a swing, 3%, 4%, one direction or the other. Depending on how you set up your structure, you're at a loss. You've got to manage the loss. But sometimes the spread goes too far against you where you can't manage it and you're going to take the 50 or 100% loss. So, I, I don't like to say this because you're a customer. I don't like to say this because you're learning and you're doing everything right. You don't like the cost of the married put position because of where you are in your portfolio. We have to find different ways to do it. You could maybe do the calendar spreads. You could maybe do the, the bull call debits or even the bull put credits or whatever direction you think the stock is going. You have to be disciplined as much as possible to yourself to realize this is known risk but not low risk. Each spread you enter, bull put, bull call, even a diagonal, the monetary amount at risk in the worst case scenario should not represent more than 4 or maybe even 5% of your total portfolio value. Think of a 5-point spread. Think of your portfolio size. What is 5% of your portfolio size? How many contracts would you trade on that 5-point spread? And does that make sense? Why should you only do a spread that risks 5% of your total portfolio? Because it's possible very quickly to realize a 100% loss. And if you take the full loss once, twice, three times, that might be 15% of your portfolio. You're making it back at a 1%, you know, 11% of that 1% clip on your winners. So you're at a 5 to 1, 7 to 1 risk reward ratio. That's where spread traders get in trouble. That's the So there is hope. It's not hopeless. You just have to remember. Okay, you just have to remember that it, it's risking. And diagonals, yeah, they're expensive because you're buying an in-the-money call typically. So you're buying a long call and selling against it. It can be pricey. But again, it's you go in the money so that you have a little bit better protection. Right? If I went at the money with a diagonal spread and the stock fell two points, I've probably just given up 40 or 50% of my long call value. If I'm in the money and it drops 4%, I've probably only given up 10 to 15% of that long call value. 
All right, last question. Then we gotta we gotta close up shop for this evening. Um, Rajiv says on call debit spread, if both strikes are in the money and the profit's not high, is there any way to tweak the position? I mean, you could roll it up. Okay, you could roll up both positions. You could roll up the sell to close the long and roll that up to try to get a lower cost basis. You could roll all of them up. Um, those are some things that you can do with the debit spreads. Uh, you can tweak them, but again, it's a risk word. Every time you do a trade-off, if you try to roll the short one up and the long one up, you'll get a lower cost basis. But at the same time, you might, you're might you going to have less protection and less probability of getting assigned for the full profit. Um, Rajiv, some people would say in this case, rather than closing it and rolling it up, just leave the bull call you have open that's near the max profit and just open a new bull call at higher strike prices if you're still bullish. So you try to win on both. That's another way to approach it as well. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that is the last question that we did receive. Uh, I hinted on this a little bit when we started looking at the charts for BAC and uh, WM and so forth. I just want to remind everyone that today's material, of course, are my thoughts on your questions designed for educational purposes, increasing investing performance and options knowledge. Any stocks or options discussed today should not be taken as direct trading suggestions. We were using examples based on stock prices. I know where they ended up today. And of course, uh, discussing with Rajiv what he was thinking about for the charts as well. Um, options do involve risk as we just talked about it at depth in the last 15 minutes there on a small rant. Uh, <laughs> but may not be suitable for all investors, but there is hope in all situations. Um, okay. Okay, a, a, I'm sorry, a follow-up thought here. I apologize for Bill. And uh, one of these might work for you, one of these might not. Um, Alex chimed back in, uh, mentioned, commented back in, and he says, yeah, I appreciate the genuine teaching here. The implied volatility is too low for actual volatility. All right. So for what Alex has been working with is covered calls and calendars. So they do like some married puts. The discipline in trading small is an ongoing challenge. So those are just some of his thoughts, Bill. It's an ongoing challenge. You will get through it. Some of those, again, the calendar spread and the covered calls might be something we want to talk about um, during next week. I don't mean during the webinar, but uh, via email or through phone calls, we can talk next week a little bit about those. But just remember, when you hear someone say that something is low risk, a spread is low risk, a butterfly is low risk, it's known risk. It's still risking 100% of whatever you put in the position, and that's how you can get into trouble. All right, so for those of you who like what you saw on some of the search tools today, um, uh, Rajiv says, uh, hey, soccer matches are going on. Let's hope England wins tomorrow. Good luck to, to Rajiv. Good luck to England there. Uh, saw France's victory, a little bit of it yesterday, um, or today, I'm sorry, and uh, that, was, that was pretty enjoyable too. Uh, so in any case, for those of you who haven't seen the tools yet, remember you can take a 14-day trial at any time. Just go to powerop.com, put in first name, last name, and email address. Uh, you'll start your trial right away. After that, uh, our different subscription service, our most popular service is the 20-minute delayed starts at $60 per month. We do offer a real-time service, and the full access to the history on the historical service is just $40 more than the 20-minute delayed. It's $100 per month, but you get access to the historical tools back to April of 2006 as well. Now, other free education available. Remember, you can always check out the blog, blog.powerop.com. We showed a couple places on our webinars page, powerop.com slash webinars.asp. We can go to the strategies menu and look at the naked put uh, adjustments we talked about, as well as the seven ways to manage a bull put credit spread we looked at with Rose's position as well. Uh, all seven are covered in the webinar, of course, but only maybe three or four really applied to what Rose was doing today. Of course, you can always take a look at us on YouTube under the user power options. Remember, if you do have any other questions later on, just send me an email at any time, support at powerop.com or support at radioactivetrading.com. Uh, please feel free to call the office, of course, during market hours at 302-992-7971. And if you're on your trial or your current subscriber, remember, you can schedule one of those coaching sessions at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining me this afternoon. Have a fantastic evening and a fantastic weekend. We'll get this posted for you hopefully this weekend or by Monday. And I hope to see you all next week at one of our other live presentations. Good night, everyone. Take care.